But the main point is, yes, there were very few carpet baggers, relatively four or 5,000, not a voting block. You're not going to get elected with the votes of carpet baggers. But they did hold significant numbers of offices. First of all, they were tied into federal patronage. They had connections in the North. They're Northerners. They had connections with, lo with Congress. So p appointments, a lot of you know, federal appointments often go to them. Um, and in states where there are very few white Republicans of Southern origin, the carpet beggars just come to the fore because there are no other whites willing to work with, the, um, you know, with, with these new with these new governments. But as voters, they, are, they, they don't count, really. There's not enough. So if, in terms of voting power, the real other group is these so-called scalawags, white, native-born Republicans in Reconstruction uh, in the South. They were not popular. Here's an Alabama newspaper in 1868. Our scalawag is the local leper of the community. Unlike the carpetbagger, he is native, which is so much the worst. Once he was respected, his head was level. He could look his neighbor in the face. Now, possessed of the itch of office, he is a mangy dog, slinking through the alleys, haunting the governor's mansion. So they didn't think that much of these scalawags. Mangy dog, just seeking office. I mean, why would anybody, white, go along with these black dominated, at least from the voting perspective, government, because they wanted political office, according to this view. Now, basically, there were, most of these scalawags were people who had been pro-union in the South before the war, or at least anti-secession. There are really two groups here. One is the group that Lincoln, remember, always kind of thought about, the old Whigs, well-to-do people, planters. Many of them had opposed secession but had accepted it once the Confederacy was at war, but always a little bit reluctant. And they assumed that if they joined the Republic, they saw the Republican Party as the party of business, not so much the party of blacks. If the South wanted to develop, recover, they would need aid from the North, they would need investment, and they felt that they were the ones but you, to, who could attract that. But they, you had to do it through the Republican Party. If you're a Democrat, you're not getting anything. So. Um, they thought you could sort of resurrect the old Whig alliance of well-to-do planters in the South and business interests um, in the North via the Republican uh, Party. And they were willing to accept, they had to accept, civil equality for blacks, but they felt that they should basically dominate uh, the Republican Party. The classic example of this is James Alcorn. He was one of the richest planters in Mississippi before the war, one of the richest. A Whig, opposed secession, and basically sat out the Civil War. He was neither pro-Northern nor pro-Southern. He just stayed on his plantation, didn't want to have anything to do with it. 1866 comes along, Alcorn says, we better ratify the 14th Amendment here. Otherwise, we don't know what's going to happen. Of course, Mississippi rejects it. 1867, he says, we must accept black suffrage. People like myself, his argument is, people like myself have to take the lead. If well-to-do prominent whites don't take the lead, then who knows, demagogues and radicals and others are going to take over the state. We can make it, he uses this phrase, a harnessed revolution. A harnessed revolution. Where blacks will be the voters, but people like himself will be in charge. And he does bring a bunch of these old Whig planters along, and in fact, he gets elected as governor the first Republican governor of Mississippi in the late 1860s. And African-American voters go with him. They say, yeah, it's good to have a guy like this willing to stand up for our rights. And, you know, he's prominent. He's influential. Um, they think this is probably a good idea. Um, but as we'll see, what happens is Alcorn quickly alienates most of the black political leaders. He's very conservative. He vetoes civil rights legislation. He doesn't like to appoint blacks to office. By 1873, the black, local, the black officials who are very organized in Mississippi basically go to a carpetbagger, Ames, Delbert Ames, a general from the Civil War. He's now in Mississippi. And they say, we want you to run for governor. We do not trust Alcorn anymore. And they basically kick out Alcorn, who then goes to the Senate, remember, and wouldn't 
wouldn't introduce uh, Blanche Bruce, but the black leadership puts Ames forward as their can, and they get him elected as governor, and he will, we'll see next week, he's the governor when all the violence and everything takes place in Mississippi. But, so Alcorn shows both the possibilities and the limits of this upper class scalawagism, that he's willing to be the leader, but not just go along with uh, you know, any genuine black uh, political power. But by far the largest group of these scalawags is these poorer whites in the upcountry. We have seen them, the people in East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, uh, Northern Alabama, Northern Georgia, um, the hill country whites. Some of them had been loyal to the Union all the way through the war. Some of them had turned against the war, the Confederacy, because of things we talked about, you know, the 20 Negro law, impressment, taxation. And these states, Tennessee, North Carolina, Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia, have a significant numbers of these white Republicans. And the, the issues there are basically two. One, they just don't like the planters. They do not want the planters back in control, and they quickly, once Andrew Johnson's plan fails, they decide there's no alternative but black suffrage. Without black suffrage, the planters will rule the South forever. So not that they're free from racism, hardly, but they are willing to make a deal. The choice, as one newspaper says, is between salvation at the hand of the Negro and destruction at the hand of the rebels. And these areas are racked with internal conflict, both in the Civil War and right after, violence between pro-Confederate and pro-Union families, and they have suffered, a lot of these places, they have suffered very severe retribution during the Civil War, and they want to get back at these, um, at these rebels, as they call them, and in fact, pressure to disenfranchise former uh, Confederates, we'll see this next time, pressure to comes not from blacks, who are committed to universal manhood suffrage, but from these upcountry scalawags. They want to make absolutely sure they're keeping these Confederates out of power, and one way is to prevent them from voting, which for a while is done in a few of these states. But the second issue, second only to unionism in these places, is economic conditions, debt. These guys are mostly farm owners, but they come out of the Civil War immensely in debt. The war, remember, has destroyed the economy plunged many of them into poverty. Pre-war debts are still out there. Um, most of them are self-sufficient farmers concentrating not on a cash crop, but on uh, growing food for their own families. They come out of the war impoverished. They're afraid of losing their land. The blacks want to get land. The white upcountry is afraid of losing the land they own before the Civil War. And, um, you know, and, and what they like in what, what, what the Republicans are pushing in those air in these states is debtor relief, debtor relief. These new constitutions contain what they call homestead exemptions up to a certain amount that, in other words, you can't lose your home for debt up to a certain amount of money, your, your home can't be seized up to $1,000 or $5,000 or something. Uh, or suspension of the collection of debts. Georgia puts that temporarily into their uh, new state constitution. Um, and um, what's interesting is how black members of those constitutional conventions support these measures. On one level, it would actually be better for African Americans if all this land was thrown on the market. If all these people did lose their land, it might make it easier for blacks to get some land, but they're, more, but they're smart. They say, we want a political coalition here with these white farmers. We do not want them to lose their land and become totally embittered against Reconstruction. So all sorts of interesting political calculations are going on here. But just to finish up, these years, 1867, 1868, 1869, are really a years of revolution, political revolution in the South. Um, Go back to McCurry's um, book and how she talks about the emergence onto the stage of politics of poor women in the South who had been pretty much, you know, voiceless before the Civil War. Now we have other groups. We have the former slaves, now as official political actors, and we have these white yeomen, at least in some parts of the South, who are finally 
mobilized politically to promote their own uh, economic and political interests. So this is a, a period of tremendous exhilaration. Uh, new ideas are floating around the South, which had, were not uncommon in the North, but were really unknown before the Civil War. The South is jolted into the 19th century in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. One local Republican newspaper up in the upcountry says, you know, remember that the Republican Party is the party of progress, civilization, popular government, equal liberty, the education, and the elevation of the masses, brotherly affection toward all men. I mean, these, you know, this is astonishing in a non-racial way, two years, three years after the end of slavery. So the question we will see next time is, what do these governments try to do to actually fulfill these aspirations uh, that are part of the political agenda now in, in 1868?